Uh, thanks very much for uh, for attending this CFA VBA webinar on China and its trillion dollar bond market. Uh, it's sponsored by Fidelity, uh, and my name is Kees van van den Berg. Uh, I'm a board member and a treasurer for the CFA Society VBA Netherlands. Um, well, let's say that's my uh, that's my night role. Uh, during the day, I'm uh, also a senior strategist at APG Asset Management. Um, and in that role, um, I've recently focused a lot on investing in China for my clients. And that's also why I'm very interested to hear the insights from two absolute experts on the topic. Um, before I introduce them, uh, a brief overview of what we're going to discuss today. Uh, the first part of the webinar presented by Thijs Knaap uh, will dive into the economic context of investing in Chinese growth. Uh, Thijs is chief economist at APG Asset Management and recently spent two years in Hong Kong. Um, Thijs will, uh, as far as aware, he, he left just before the riots, um, but Thijs will discuss how the Chinese economy and markets today bring an almost irresistible combination of growth, size, diversification and yield. Um, but also new labor and capital, the main sources of growth so far, uh, they are rapidly losing their power. Um, and at the same time, the outside world is starting to put constraints in place. Um, Thijs Knaap will look at the changes that need to happen for China to keep performing into the next decades. Um, after Thijs's presentation, uh, Vanessa Chen will continue and look at what it means for China onshore bond market. Um, Vanessa is an investment director for Fidelity International. Uh, she works within the investment team and with Fidelity's fixed income portfolio managers. Uh, she has a strong focus on Asian credit markets and the China bond market. Uh, Vanessa will provide an overview of the China bond market as it has reached 16 trillion US dollar. Uh, it's becoming, well, it is already the second largest bond market in the world. Uh, and interesting, she will also make the case for investing in the China bond market and will provide some interesting numbers and arguments. Um, before we move over to Thijs, uh, some housekeeping remarks. Uh, we kindly ask you to make sure your camera is off and your microphone is muted, um, as this will make my life and the life of our presenters a bit uh, easier. Um, there's room for Q&A at the end of each session, but also at the end of the webinar as well. Uh, so if you have any, any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, you can type your questions in the chat. Uh, and I will bring them forward uh, to, to the speakers. Um, in, in the WebEx uh, software, uh, the chat can be enabled on the right hand lower side of, the, of your screen, uh, probably also on, on, on the uh, Explorer version. Uh, you can direct the question to everyone, uh, that way I will be able to read it as well, but you can also direct the question directly to me uh, if you don't want other people to, to read the question. Um, the slides will be available on the event website, so after the webinar. Um, so now over to Thijs. Uh, Thijs is part of the economics and strategic asset allocation team in the fiduciary department of APG. Uh, Thijs advises APG's pension fund clients on their investment strategy. Uh, Thijs has worked for several Dutch universities before joining the CPB Netherlands Bureau for Economic Policy Analysis in 2008. Um, he has worked for APG since uh, 2011 and recently spent two years in their Hong Kong office as a strategist responsible for Asia. Uh, the main topic of his work is the interaction of trends in the global economy with developments on financial markets. He is a strong believer in the use of economic scenarios in which the effects of monetary, fiscal and trade policy are combined with secular changes in wealth, demography and politics. Thijs, over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Kees Harm. Uh, I am trying to Share my screen as I uh, uh, start talking to you. Can you confirm that you can see the yes. slides? Yes. Very good. Oh, Thanks. Good. I understand I have about half an hour to talk about uh, China, which is, of course, uh, not a lot of time. I mean, even half an hour at a Chinese restaurant is not uh, very long to check out the dishes. So uh, my talk will be high over. Um, I will uh, uh, talk about the Chinese economy, which is large and varied. It is a continent-sized economy. Uh, clearly, I can't talk about all of it, uh, but I will try and uh, talk to you about what is most important right now. So what are the uh, uh, subjects that you should look at if you want to know more about China as it stands currently? Uh, maybe if we do the talk again in half a year, uh, the talk will be very different. But this is this is what I uh, make of it right now. So I, there are two parts to this talk. Uh, first of all, I want to look back a little bit to talk about Chinese growth and how extraordinary it has been and also to discuss where it's come from. 
Uh, and then uh, after that, we'll look at the future um, and basically uh, look at three things. So is the current uh, state, the, the, the state that China has ended up in stable or is it just a house of cards? I will argue that it's quite stable. Uh, then the question is what's next? Uh, and there, of course, uh, there's a big uh, issue because the way that China has grown so far is going to be different from how it's going to have to grow in the future. Uh, and then we'll you know, talk a little bit about uh, some of the questions that are uh, th that we have around this, this, this change. So can China cope with the changes that are, um, that are coming towards it? And I will have a very nuanced answer. Maybe yes, maybe no, uh, but we'll get into that in a second. But first of all, let's look a little bit at the past and uh, let's, uh, let's see what this, uh, this amazing story of Chinese uh, economic growth has been. Um, so this is uh, a quite complicated chart, but if I can explain it to you, it'll make uh, many things very clear. Uh, what you see here over the years from 1980 to uh, a little bit into the future is the level of uh, GDP per head. So how much each person produces and I've made it relative to the level of GDP per head in the United States. So if you look at the chart over uh, on the top, there's a a horizontal line, which reads one all over, that's the United States. Their GDP per head grows about 1%, one and a half percent per year over this period. It keeps going up. And then all the other lines are other countries as they stand relative to the United States. So over on top, you see Germany and the Netherlands, and we're sort of you know, between 0 0.8 and 0 0.95. We're close to the United States. Our productivity, our GDP per head grows at about the same rate. We don't really go any closer, but we also don't lag. Uh, and that's sort of, uh, you know, keeping up with the US. Then there's a bunch of countries at the bottom, which are doing more or less the same thing. So they're at a much lower level, less than 10% of US productivity. And they're also, you know, they're growing, they're not falling behind, but they're also not catching up to the United States. So these include countries like Pakistan, or Nigeria, which are all the way at the bottom. Of course, I want to direct your attention to uh, the dotted line, which is China. And you can see a number of things from this graph, which is why it's so useful. Uh, first of all, China was really poor in 1980. Their production per head was at about two and a half percent of the of the American level, which is very, very low. Uh, secondly, it's grown quite a lot. You can see the line going up and there has been uh, uh, catch up growth. So they've come closer to the US at quite an astonishing rate. If you do the math on these, uh, uh, on these numbers, you see that the Chinese um, uh, growth has been uh, on the order of 8% uh, in GDP per head, which means that uh, the, the, at the end of this period in 2020, production per head is 24 times as high as it was in 1980. So that's each person being 24 times as productive as they were in the 1980s. And so this adds up to an enormous uh, amount in, in growth. Uh, GDP is up 35 times since, since 1980. So this is amazing. The other amazing thing that you should see is that uh, by going from about 2.5% to about 28%, there's still a lot of room left to grow, right? China is not yet at the level of the US, or not even Germany or the Netherlands. So this could keep going for a while uh, if they can keep it up. So. What exactly happened since 1980? Um, well, essentially, uh, China uh, uh, made a plan and went with it. So I, I recently finished this book. I don't know if you can still see me. Uh, this is on Jan Timbergen, who is a famous Dutch economist. And he was into plans. He, he liked economic plans. He even founded the planning bureau, the central planning bureau where I've worked. And it, this, this always sounds kind of funny to us, you know, how can you plan economic growth? But you have to remember when Jan Timmerhagen founded the CPB, we were just after World War II that the economy was destroyed. We had to grow and it wasn't really very hard to figure out, you know, new things. We just had to rebuild the economy. And in a sense, that's what the Chinese did as well. They had a plan, the East Asian growth model, which wasn't so much about you know, we have to figure out new things to do, but rather we have to catch up with the rest. We have to industrialize. We have to get people out of subsistence farming and into factories. And they basically followed the plan. And that led to this enormous growth. Once again, here's a graph. It shows you that the GDP growth rate has been about 10% since 1980. There have been ups and downs, but essentially this plan has just worked. And it's worked by 
yeah, as, you know, doing things that are not very complicated, but doing them well. So getting people out of uh, subsistence agriculture into factories and accumulating a capital stock. So uh, the things that you need to produce and just keeping up with it. Uh, there's been a bit of luck with it as well, right? This happened at the right time for China. There were a lot of young people. They were well educated. It came at a time when the world was ready for it. But still, they executed the East Asian growth model and they did it well. Um, so now, of course, the interesting thing is what happens when the plan sort of runs out. And for this, I want to do a little bit of growth accounting. So if you look at, uh, at GDP growth, the growth in production, which I've already told you was very large in, uh, in China over the last uh, couple of decades, you find that it comes from a number of different factors. So as I told you, a lot of it comes from getting people out of the uh, bogs into the factories and getting capital to grow. And then there's a bit of productivity growth as you become more and more efficient at what you do. Um, Oh, I've, uh, uh, I've skipped a bit because I wanted to tell you that um, for these factors, China has depended a lot on the last two. So labor force growth and capital growth have been big contributors to, uh, to Chinese growth. Productivity growth has also been important. Um, but if we look forward, then the important thing to, uh, to take away, and that was the slide that I was going to, to show you, is that we're going to run out of, uh, of, of uh, labor and capital to add. And so here are a few graphs that illustrate this. Um, first of all, the labor force. So on the left, you see the working age population and the total population. And they're both sort of peaking uh, relatively soon. The working age population already in four years from now and these are projections, so it might be earlier or sooner, but it's going to be somewhere around uh, this decade that we'll have top uh, working age. And after that, it declines. Is that a bad thing? Well, it's not good for growth, but it's also not disastrous. If you reckon that Germany has already had its peak in labor force in 2001, Italy has also passed it. And as the, the Eurozone entirely will, will be at its top labor force next year, and then it will decline. I don't think we're sort of uh, going to stop growing, but it'll have to come from different sources. Um, the same for capital. The gra graph on the right shows you the share of capex, so gross capital formation, uh, and it's a share of GDP. And so there's a bunch of countries there. You see they spend about 25, 30% on GDP of GDP on uh, on capex. And then there's China, which again is the dotted line. And so they've basically just increased this fraction up to the point where they're now investing almost half of GDP in, uh, in new capital. Um, you can do this. It's very good for your capital stock. It also helps you to grow. But at some point, you just accumulate a lot of capital uh, compared to GDP. And uh, as it happens, everything that you have a lot of becomes less useful. So the productivity starts to go down. Um, where are we? Well, if you work out the capital uh, GDP ratio, so the capital output ratio, then you know developed countries are somewhere between three and a half and six. Uh, China went from one and a half in uh, 1980 to about five now, so it's already quite high. So it stands to reason that uh, adding more capital, you know, it'll help growth a little bit, but it's going to be it's going to be less and less useful, and it comes with dangers. So once again, if you look at the slide on the right, you can see the orange line which sort of mimics China. It sort of stays close to it all through 1980, 1990, up to 2008 even. Uh, that line is for Spain, uh, which added a lot of capital up to the financial crisis. And then all of a sudden, while well, you're familiar with, with Spain, there was a huge crisis. They stopped investing, but they also had this, this debt crisis that we're all quite familiar with, I guess. Uh, and so a lot of times you wonder, you know, is China going to go through the same process? Are they going to find out that they've overaccumulated and are they going to run into a, a debt crisis? So this is the debt issue. I wanted to address it uh, uh, for a moment. Uh, and so the first thing to note is that, yes, there is indeed a lot of debt in China. The graph on the left shows you the percentage of debt uh, when you express it as, uh, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and it's sort of uh getting to the levels of the eu and and the eurozone so it's close to 300 uh it's the eurozone is at 288 the us at 290 so uh there is a lot of debt but the important thing also is that it's locally financed which the spanish couldn't really uh say uh, the same thing so the two graphs on the right show you the international asset position of the chinese 
there's a lot of lines and a lot of colors, but basically take away from it that uh, China owns a lot more of the world than that the world uh, owns of China. So the, uh, the claims that it has on the, on the rest of the world are a lot larger. Well, these are net flow, so maybe the gross are still kind of, uh, can still get you into trouble. But um, my conclusion from looking at this for a while is that with the debt mostly financed locally, the odds that you're going to end up in a stain type situation where external creditors all of a sudden are going to demand their money back and you're in trouble, those odds are kind of low. There are drawbacks to the uh, high debt load. Uh, I've already mentioned that if you accumulate too much capital, there's going to be a bit of you know uh, trouble around around productivity, uh, but it's slow moving trouble. It's misallocation trouble rather than liquidity trouble, and it's being worked on. So I'm sure Vanessa will talk about this as well. Uh, the bond market, which fun finances a lot of debt, uh, is lately starting to see more defaults. There's going to be an increase in in discipline there. Uh, and that should increase uh, the efficiency with which uh, capital is deployed. There's also been a, a program of financial de-risking that uh, the uh, leader of China, uh, Xi Jinping, has started, uh, and that has really um, uh, tamed the growth of, of, of debt, as, as well as sort of the kind of debt that, that looks kind of dangerous, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. So my main point here is that um, there's a lot of capital investment. It's worth kind of well, um, but maybe it's time to start looking for another kind of growth in the future. It looks like there's probably uh, about enough capital in the uh, in the economy. So let's get back to the economy uh, and uh, and and sort of see what uh, where we are and what the structure is going to be. Once again, it's high over, so I'm going to make a number of sweeping generalizations. Uh, one of them. Uh, you can see on the left, so the sweeping generalization of China up to about, uh, say, 10 years ago is that it, it was a low-wage country, essentially an assembly line for developed countries where your iPhone is being assembled, right? So if you look at the back of your iPhone, if you have one, it says it's designed in California, but it's assembled in China. And so the Chinese are putting together these uh, these parts and they're shipping it back to us or to the Americans. And then that's sort of the role that they play in uh, in the world economy. Well, that was about 10 years ago. You can call it factory China, uh, but it's coming to an end. And the reasons for this are on the right. Uh, so one of the reasons that it was appealing to do this is that there was a, a low wage advantage. That's really uh, becoming less and less of an advantage as wages go up in China. There's also been this change in attitude uh, towards this whole model, especially in the US, where they've started to think better of, of letting everything being produced in China and uh, the access to technology, but also the access to the market has been reduced. Well, uh, you can also see this in the, uh, in the numbers. So the uh, exports as a percentage of GDP are on the left. They went up since 1980, they went up a lot. It's the East Asian growth model, but they peaked. And then uh, since 2006, it's come down and it's still an important part of the economy, but not as big as it was uh, up to then. Well, what replaced it, I would argue that the new model is not longer factory China, but market China. So uh, since the growth has been so large, spending power has increased. There's a lot of Chinese and you can sell products to them rather than to the rest of the world. Uh, this home market has become very uh, appealing, and that's become uh, a new source of growth. So um, factory China ends, market China begins, uh, and, and with that, we can see a new growth model emerging. However, every time there's a change, of course, the question is, is this change going to work? Uh, is the uh, growth going to be as impressive as it was in the past? And there's a few questions I have around this. They're at the bottom of this, uh, of this slide on the right. Uh, and the first question is that if you want to sell products that you develop yourself to people uh, who are in your own country, you have to do innovation. And so the institutional setup in China is kind of peculiar. And the question around this that sort of asks itself is, is this going to be conducive for innovation going forward? The other question is, there are external constraints that weren't there in 1980 uh, when China entered the world market. One has to do with geopolitics. The attitudes toward China are changing, and the other has to do with the environment. Uh, if you, your big country becomes very big economically, it starts to put a burden on the environment. And the question is, you know, can the world take a China that keeps on growing? Uh, 
Um, I will address the first two questions. I will say very little about the environment, uh, maybe make a few remarks left and right. Uh, that's just because of, you know, I don't have uh, enough time to address everything, but it, it should be in the back of your mind. But first of all, let's talk about the, the, the economic structure, and especially as it pertains to innovation. And to do that, we have to look at SOEs, state-owned enterprises. So if you're not familiar at all with the Chinese uh, economy, I've just told you it's grown very quickly. Um, it comes, but also because it comes from a very poor uh, base. But the other important thing is that uh, there are state-owned enterprises and they are a chunky part of the economy. So we are familiar with uh, ex-communist economies like uh, Eastern Europe or the, uh, the USSR, later Russia, who sold off all of their SOEs and then they sort of disappeared or they became private companies. China didn't do that. Uh, they also protected them in a way that made sure that they weren't outcompeted by private enterprise. There was a large share of SOEs back in 1980. The share has shrunk, but it has stopped shrinking in about 2008. And since then, the, uh, the role of state-owned enterprises has stayed kind of uh, the same. They, uh, they employ about 20% of people. Uh, and these are, um, these are an important factors. So if you want to sort of sketch what they are, there's a table on the left that tells you that it's, this is concentrated in what the government thinks are key sectors. So the ones that you would need to control the economy, fuels, finance, industry, they're large companies. Uh, and they, uh, they produce about 30% of GDP. Uh, if you want to know um, what these uh, companies are, there's a list on the right, and these are the uh, list with the, of the companies with the most revenue in 2020. So they're just big companies. And you can see that a lot of them, uh, out of the top 11, I've made 11 because I put Huawei uh, on the list. I like to have you know, at least one private company on there. So out of the top 11, uh, there are nine state-owned, uh, and actually the top three here are all part of the top five of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, the other two are Amazon and Walmart. So these are huge companies. They're state-owned, and as you can see, they're in these uh, key sectors uh, where they uh, where they operate. Um, they're state-owned, but you can own a share, right? A lot of these uh, have equity listed on the uh, uh, on the stock market in Hong Kong or in the, on the mainland, and you can buy. Uh, a share if you like. However, um, the, the government will also be there uh, with you to own the company. Now, why do I talk about this? Well, innovation politics in China, they have to innovate, um, looks very uh, centrally guided. Again, there's a plan, and the plan is for these SOEs and state banks to drive innovation. Um, that is unfamiliar to us, I say, as a Western economist. So we like to think that innovation comes from startups and, and private companies. This is a different approach. And uh, it's really the Chinese way. So uh, the government says we can uh, steer this innovation and we can let the SOEs um, uh, become successful by giving them money through the state banks and basically telling them what to do. So there's a bunch of plans, uh, which you can only call industrial politics. Uh, which go by names as Made in China uh, 2025, Military Civil Fusion. Um, these plans basically consist of telling companies, you need to grow in this field, please develop the technology and just uh, go ahead and, uh, and do it. Uh, this sounds kind of uh, odd to the Western ear. Uh, at the same time, you can't deny that it's been incredibly successful so far. I've shown you the growth numbers. And it is a, a fact that China can marshal uh, a lot of resources, both in terms of money and in terms of people, to uh, to drive growth. But it's it it it's kind of different than the way we would approach it, and we can't be sure whether it will be successful or not. At the same time, it's not the only bet. As I told you, the Chinese economy is large and varied, and there's a lot of different aspects to it. The other aspect, of course, is uh, that there's a private sector which uh, which is very vibrant, uh, very competitive, and they also innovate. And so on the right, on top, you see the, the chairman of the party who tells you, you know, tells the state companies to innovate. But at the bottom, you also see the result of private innovation. One you'll all be familiar with, uh, which is TikTok, which is a fantastic algorithm that my kids use to look at different uh, clips on your phone. The other is this crazy project where there are, uh, what is it, hundreds of drones in the sky above Shanghai, which give you a QR code that you can point your phone at so that you can 
order something over the internet. It is there to show show you that there are uh, private sector innovations in China that look very impressive even to uh, to our eyes. Um, so, uh, sort of summarizing, there there needs to be innovation. There needs to be productivity growth in China. Uh, the official plan is to run it through uh, the centrally guided strategy, uh, but there's also this ecosystem of private companies that is also churning out innovations that are not to be underestimated. All of this together will determine whether China will succeed in, uh, in keeping growing through uh, innovation. Um, we can't be sure whether it will work, but I wouldn't underestimate it. Of course, the big question for investors is, uh, and I, uh, we can quote Whitney Houston on this. How will I know? Uh, you know, so so uh, the, the the numbers are always kind of uh, too late. You won't know the innovations have happened until many years after. But I think if you want to know whether the innovation strategy in China is going to be a success, you can look for two things, uh, two signs that this is working. One would be the emergence and the success of Chinese global brands. So if the Chinese succeed in making something that everybody in the world wants, then that would be a, a, a sign that this innovation strategy has worked. And I was watching football at the European Championships, and I don't know if you've noticed, if you watch it too, that there is a lot of uh, signs already around the uh, pitch for uh, Chinese products. So I was thinking maybe this is already a sign that Chinese innovation is working, but then a lot of them are actually in Chinese characters directed at Chinese audiences. So this is not yet a global uh, success uh, that we uh, that we can point to uh, as an, as evidence of Chinese uh, innovation working, but maybe it'll come. Um, the other uh, sign that you can look at uh, to tell whether Chinese innovation strategies have been successful is if we're going to see Chinese complaints of IP theft. So for years this has been uh, the other way around. Uh, Western companies, a lot of American companies have complained that the Chinese have stolen their intellectual property and they've complained to uh, their own governments and to the WTO. Uh, if this turns around and China starts to complain about Western companies stealing their IP, that's also a sign that they've been successful in innovating and developing something that, uh, that becomes uh, successful worldwide. And as I've argued, it'll be a sign that the Chinese economy has turned the corner and keep on growing um, in, a, in, a new, uh, in a new environment. So that's for innovation. The other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, geopolitics, which is also kind of uh, scary for an economist. It's not my field. But if I had to sort of very briefly sketch uh, how the world looked and how it's changed, I would say since about 1990, we've lived in a multilateral world. So a, a legal world, a world that was made for lawyers, uh, where rules and contracts uh, determine who is right and who is wrong. And you can go to courts or the international organizations and you can get what is yours if, if you don't like what your counterpart is doing to it to you. Um, this is a great world for investors, right? It's a globalizing world and we can uh, diversify our investments. We can put some money here and some money there and the, the rules will guide you know, everything and you will be treated fairly. This is also the world that has allowed China to become very successful. Like I said, it allowed it to uh, build this export business uh, and, and grow very quickly uh, on the back of the world trading system. Since about 2016, the election of Donald Trump, we've seen a different narrative, namely uh, China is not a, uh, a friendly uh, factory that, that helps everybody, but it is a geopolitical rival. You can read the text, the new uh, US Secretary of State saying, China is posing a challenge to the rules-based order. Um, well, you've all read the news. Uh, I just want to make a few remarks. Uh, first of all, it's a less pleasant world for investors, right? If we're no longer ruled by contracts, but we're ruled by geopolitics, so power policy, um, then uh, that makes it a lot less appealing to put your money everywhere because who knows what you'll be in the middle of uh, next time. Um, it's also a less pleasant world for China, right? You, you can no longer work on the back of other people's um, uh, knowledge and, and parts. You have to do a lot of stuff yourself. Um, and so again, China will have to adapt to this uh, if they want to su succeed in the future. Uh, how will I know? Um, so how will we know whether China is, is doing well? Uh, I would suggest you look for the following. Uh, if we can 
there's a lot of talk of conflict uh, between China and the US, between China and other countries. As long as we don't see actual conflict, the system is still working. So um, as the Americans call it, as long as there's no kinetic solutions to problems, um, I would say that China is adapting to this successfully. If we see actual conflict, then of course uh, we've we've come to a world where um, yeah, which has become very dangerous for uh, for investors. How will China adapt? And this is uh, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, this is the plan. Uh, it's uh, something that was published in May of last year, so about a, about a year ago, uh, which is called dual circulation. And as with all high level concepts, it's kind of open to interpretation. Nobody really knows what it means, but it, it's sort of steering uh, the direction. And the idea is that this whole theme of uncoupling, so China uncoupling from the rest of the world is in a way facilitated. So there's there are two circles here with arrows, uh, two circulations. And that's the center circle is the internal circulation. So it basically says China is big enough to take care of its own. Uh, domestic demand is is good enough for Chinese companies, and really, uh, you know, we, we like interacting with the outside world, but we don't have to. If it, in, if it's possible, we just want to produce stuff ourselves for our own uses. So this internal circulation should be able to run whatever the Americans throw at it. The external loop is basically China's way of saying, well, but we don't want to turn our backs on the world. We want to continue the integration with the outside world. But we want to do it our own way. So we want to uh, engage the world on our uh, terms uh, by uh, allowing foreign companies to operate in China and by, by interacting with the others, but really preferably on Chinese standards, preferably through uh, renminbi rather than dollars, preferably uh, uh, in a way that we are still kind of in control. And then um, uh, this is, again, like, it's a high level plan, so it's hard to, to make this concrete. But what I take away from it is that the Chinese think that the Chinese economy is strong enough to do this. They also take responsibility for the problems that are there. So uh, this is the one thing I'll say about the environment. There is a, a large section on environmental cleanup in the internal loop. Uh, so they will do this. There's the commitment to decarbonize by 2060. Uh, and there's the financial de-risking. So they're taking responsibility for the uh, the degree of debt buildup that has been there. Both of these things make sense. They're quite, kind of important to, uh, for the current uh, regime to stay in power. Uh, but it's, uh, it's counting on the Chinese economy being big and strong enough to, uh, uh, to be able to run this by itself. I have one more slide uh, just for investors. If you want to, so I've not told you about Chinese growth. I've told you about the things that are needed to keep it going. Do you need to uh, uh, invest in it? I would say maybe there's a good number of reasons to do it. Uh, if you want to invest in China because it's going to be the largest economy, maybe that's not such a great reason because there are many large economies that are very unprofitable. But there are a couple of things that make it attractive. Mostly, if they can keep growing, profits will be uh, increasing. That's good for investors. It's also a separate market, especially if this internal circulation is going to make it uncoupled from the rest of the world, you'll have a low correlation diversifier. And it's um, it's a market where there's a lot of uh, opportunities still for investors to to get risk premia and alpha uh, from from different markets. However, uh, there's uh, there's a few rules of the road, uh, which we've all had also had to learn. So my company has invested in China. Uh, we've really elected to go with a local partner uh, to to, to sort of learn how to how to deal with the complexities of Chinese investing, uh, APG has a, a, a we work together with eFund, a large uh, Chinese investor, and it's helped us to sort of skip the learning phase and uh, and very quickly uh, get uh, ahead of sort of quali credit quality issues. Um, for Western investors, there's also the responsible investing angle. Um, which can also be hard to navigate. Uh, we've succeeded, we think, in applying the same standards that we apply everywhere uh, and still you know, uh, be able to deploy a lot of capital in the, in the Chinese economy. So concluding, um, Chinese growth has been strong. It's been unusual, uh, but I don't think it's been too good to be true. Uh, but there are, however, new challenges going forward. 
which I've talked about, outside constraints and the need to innovate domestically. If you're an investor, uh, this means that you're probably exposed to China in some way already, even if you don't invest there. Uh, but it also brings new opportunities uh, to you if you want to uh, broaden your reach uh, and, uh, and bring some money there. Uh, it's a large market, there's yield. Uh, however, you'll need a, a good investment process to deal with the uncertainties that are there. Uh, that's what I wanted to, uh, uh, to discuss. I'm going to stop sharing this uh, presentation so you see my face. Uh, and I'll give it back to Case Harm for uh, uh, for questions. Thanks, uh, Thijs. Thanks a lot for your interesting presentation. Um, I don't think Whitney Houston ever expected to be quoted in a finance <laughs> webinar. I'm not sure if it's ever been done, but uh, props for, for doing it. Um, so uh, just uh, another housekeeping remark, which I forgot. Uh, this session is being uh, recorded. So if you don't like your uh, your face to be on the recording, uh, switch off your uh, your camera. Uh, whether you're in your pajamas or not. Um, also, there's some room for questions, so please uh, please put your questions in the chat so I can uh, uh, raise them to uh, to our speakers. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, for Thijs. Um, one interesting, and, and you touched upon this already a little bit, but um, <clears throat> with the move from, from factory China to market China, uh, do you think China could be best off or better off with deglobalization compared to the US and the EU? Uh, as you explained, dual circulation, they probably think themselves that they do. Uh, do you share that view? Yeah, I, it's kind of interesting. The, uh, it, this whole dual circulation sort of comes to grips with uh, decoupling and it says maybe it's not so bad. Uh, so I think it's important to know that factory China depended on, uh, on outside resources in really three ways. Uh, so it was driven by intellectual property that was in the hands of foreigners, how to make an iPhone. Uh, it was using parts that was um, that, that came in from, from outside. And then the products were sold to foreigners. Um, so these three uh, things in, in a decoupling scenario would be cut off. Um, that's all right. So if you have market China, you can sell to the Chinese. There's a lot of them. They're getting to be pretty rich. So the market is big enough. Uh, but you still need parts and you still need intellectual property. Uh, and so there, um, you know, uh, so does everybody else, right? The Netherlands is in a, in a different, that is no, in a position that is no different from China. We also need parts and intellectual property. So basically that says that deglobalization is bad for everybody if, you, if you're cut off from this. Is it less bad for China? I don't know. This is the big question, right? Can, there's a there's a huge initiative to sort of plug the gaps uh, where you're uh, quite uh, familiar, I guess, with the chips the problem, computer chips. You need them for everything. China is not yet really good at making them, but they're really trying to catch up with this. But there are many other parts, and there's a bunch of intellectual property that you need. So, it I unfortunately I just have to say. Um, China is, it, you know, it's a, it, we don't know. Uh, we also don't know for many other countries, uh, but, the, but the big market is, is a big advantage uh, compared to, say, a smaller country that is cut off. Um, hi, it's Vanessa here. Just throw in one piece of data, which um, the audience may be interested in. Actually, China, it's one of the countries that have the largest amount of patent application for the past two years. So in terms of innovation, they're certainly putting into the effort, echoing to what Thais is saying, some of the historical um, IP, they may potentially need to rely on it. But going forward, I think China has put in a lot of emphasis in terms of their own, own innovation, their own patent, their own IP going forward as well. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Vanessa. Uh, also an interesting remark from Shen Xu. Uh, who is not so optimistic with the economic growth in China. It's not really a question, so I'm just, just putting it out there. Uh, three reasons for that. Uh, slow growth of labor, which I think Thijs already uh, touched upon, uh, but testified by the third child policy recently, uh, the bubble of the real estate industry, um, similar to other developed markets, I guess, and being, being gradually isolated by the Western countries. Um, so, yeah, any, any remarks there, Thijs, or do you, do you agree? Uh, yeah, labor I've touched upon, so I think that's uh, that's certainly true. We've seen the demographics. Uh, like I said, I, I don't think this is deadly. So we, we're we're seeing a similar thing in the in the eurozone, right? Uh, but the, the the rate at which uh, the population declines in China is quite a lot higher. Uh, so that that may make it worse. Uh, I think that 
the numbers are, yeah. So in, if, if you trust these demographic projections, who knows if they're correct, but then by 2060, uh, the labor force in the Eurozone will go down by about 9% and China will go down by about 20%. So you need a lot of productivity to, uh, uh, to, to make up for that. And that is of course, indeed related to the, the demographic policy that has been in place years before where couples were only allowed to have one child. And you see that there is now a, re a reaction to this by saying, well, you can have three. Uh, I understand that not a lot of people are actually choosing to, uh, to have three. So these demographic problems are really hard to solve. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's one reason to be uh, to be less optimistic. However, it's, it's common to a lot of places, right? So like I said, the Eurozone, um, other parts of Asia also, only the U.S. seems to be a bit exempt uh, if they keep letting immigrants in uh, from the demographic pressures. Um, I, the other two uh, points, so uh, real estate, yes, uh, you know, it's a fast growing sector. You also know that you can't depend on it for continuous growth, right? At some point, there are enough buildings, uh, especially if the population is not growing anymore. Um, this is, I haven't talked about this, but but one uh, way out of this is this Belt and Road uh, initiative. It's a way to deploy, you know, building capacity outside of China. You can still, you know, produce buildings, except you'll put them somewhere else. Um, it won't solve everything, but maybe it's one one sort of you know, uh, a way to to make sure that th there's no hard stop uh, that that uh, causes a recession. But it's it's true. It's a very um, it's a very big sector, a very important sector, and it's very hard to control, especially price developments. But I would argue we face the same problems here, right? I don't know if you've looked at house prices in Holland lately, but it's uh, it's quite something. Yeah, maybe one final question, uh, Thijs, which I got. Um, do you think that China can keep on engaging with the outside world on its own terms, or will developed countries put, put a stop to that? Um, if they can. Yeah, I, so... I. We're kind of far away from China here. Uh, I wouldn't underestimate the, uh, the influence of the Chinese in their immediate neighborhood, right? So a lot of countries around China will for sure, you know, engage with it, whether we like it or not, uh, because it's just the biggest neighbor and it's a huge economic influence. I don't think we have any means of stopping that. Uh, there's also this Belt and Road Initiative, which, which puts them, uh, you know, in, in a lot of other places. And then we've seen China sort of act opportunistically uh, also with other countries, even in the, in the Eurozone, right? So uh, Italy, uh, Serbia, China owns a port in, in, in Greece. Uh, and so for sure, they've tried to uh, engage with countries on their own terms. Uh, however, you know, all of these initiatives are, are kind of old and maybe they predate the new situation. Um, and so in that sense, it's also uh, essential, I think, that they, if this fails, they can fall back on their own circulation, right? So that there is this, whatever, you know, they're not dependent on the rest of the world to, to grant them anything. They can just you know, run their own economy and it's big enough to uh, to sustain itself. So I would say that the strategy is probably, um, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So if, you know, if there is a, a strategy of isolating China, which I hope we don't do, but uh, maybe it happens, then they can, they should be able to, you know, run it by themselves. However, the strategy is very much also to, to keep engaging uh, the way they've been doing on the, and then on their own terms. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Thijs, a lot for your presentation and also for the for the Q and A. Yes. Um, so that concludes our session with Thijs. Uh, we now move over to Vanessa. Uh, Vanessa Chen is an investment director for Fidelity. Uh, she has a strong focus on Asian credit markets and the China bond market, and is also an expert in the Asian and China high yield markets. Uh, Vanessa has in-depth knowledge of, of Asian fixed income and has spent over 18 years in Asian fixed income markets, uh, covering both the sell side, the buy side, and interestingly enough, also the rating agency's roles. Uh, Ms. Chen joined Fidelity in August 2017 from Fitch Ratings Hong Kong, uh, where she was a director in the corporate team. Uh, prior to Fitch, she had over 10 years of debt capital markets and investment banking experience in both Hong Kong and London. Uh, Vanessa, uh, very thanks for, for joining us today. Uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, hopefully, um, the following session will be useful for everyone in terms of getting a better understanding of the China bonds market and also um, trying to address any potential questions as well. Um, so let's start. Um, let's go to the slide number five. 
this is really to set the scene in terms of where Asia is um, in terms of the global bond market. Um, the Asian market at the moment is around 38 to about 40 trillion US dollars. Um, this has been one of the fastest growing market um, across or all the region across the world. You see um, for the past six years, they deliver about 60% growth. Majority of it is going to come from uh, China. The China bond market at this point in time, it's around um, 16, 17 trillion US dollars. Um, majority of it is going to be um, renminbi, China uh, renminbi denominated. Um, and this is really where the, today's topic is um, for, for the China uh, bond market. Next page. Now, zooming in to look at um, how that bond market stack up, you'll see back in 2015, this market is around 8 trillion US dollars. Six years down the road, this is already double itself to 16 trillion. And going forward in 2025, we expect this to double again. So um, one fact that whether you like it or not is that China is already the second largest bond market in the world and is one of the fastest growing. That's why when we speak to clients, um, be it in Asia, be it in Europe, um, whether they like it or not, they kind of need to put a little bit of focus or put a little bit of understanding behind it so that they can make sensible decision in terms of thinking that whether they can de de they should be deploying more resources or whether they should engage a local partner like what Thais has mentioned. If we look at the market, next page, what you can um, get your ha hands around with is the largest part will be something called China onshore bond market, which is the blue color. This is the 16, 17 trillion dollar market that I was talking about. Um, this will be onshore, i.e. it's China based. Um, it's dominated in CNY and um, the bonds that coming out of this market will be rated by domestic rating agencies. Yes, there has been increase uh, or gradual increase of participation coming from international credit rating agency, but this is still relatively early stage and majority of the bonds at this moment are still rated by domestic rating agencies. The second part of it is the 1 trillion Asian US dollar bond market in orange color. This is what typically been called offshore US dollar bond market. This market actually have exist um, for, for a while back since um, back in 2008 with, and, and even earlier on. Um, this market will be similar to um, some of the 144A RACAS deal that you potentially would look at in US dollars terms. Um, European um, corporates will have issued them. Um, and then for this particular market, it's related to Asian issuers. And the market at the moment is $1 trillion. About uh, 60 to 70% of it is actually uh, China, greater China issuers. When we talk about greater China issuer, it will be Chinese issuers, i.e. they have operation in China, Hong Kong, or Macau. Um, they will be rated by international rating agencies. So it's Fitch, it's Moody's, it's S&P, um, meaning that they will have a consistent approach compared to some of the bonds that have been rated by international rating agencies as well. Uh, within this market, um, there's about probably 30% uh, of it. It's um, going to be um, high yield. The rest of it is likely to be investment grade credits as well. Then we come to the smallest part of it, which is the yellow one. We call it China Offshore Zihan Hitch. Some will call it dim sum bond market. This is a 34 billion US dollar market. It's relatively small and to some extent, um, some of the investors or some of the international investors may not put too much attention into this. However, this market do have relatively high quality issuers and the uh, stability of this market is actually quite attractive when you wanted to have an approach to all uh, China fixed income as a whole. Breaking it down a little bit more, if we go to page eight, what you'll see is the breakdown of the Asian offshore US dollar bond market. Um, the Chinese issuer accounted for 50%. Um, the market itself is around more close to 1 um, trillion US dollars. You see that um, the country breakdown on the right hand side, as well as the ratings breakdown, majority of it is going to be in the single A category at about 41%. You see that the market has been growing since 2008. And we also, one of the note point that we need to note it is that uh, whilst the market continues to grow, the investor base also continue to grow. So for example, 10 years ago, if you want to do a US dollar bond deal, um, a lot of time we'll give advice to um, uh, 
corporates that they will need to consider 144A because they need to broaden the investor base, they need to do a roadshow in the US. But nowadays, a lot of the bonds can actually be issued in a REC as formula, um, REC, REC as format, because there is already in a sustainable, large enough Asian based investors, be it um, asset manager like ourselves, um, be it um, private investors or institutional investors. I think that breadth or depth of um, in, uh, investor base that's been developed in Asia really helps in terms of providing interest, providing um, a discussion about the market. And I think that's really why we have actually for the past year or so continue to be getting a lot of interest coming from European investors looking at Asian credits um, as, as an alternative for um, Euro or even US IG as well. Moving on to page nine, this is the dim sum bond market that we talked about earlier on. This market is actually very interesting um, because it it began back in 2013, 2012, where um, there was an increased amount of deposits on, in renminbi sitting in the offshore market, i.e. Hong Kong. Um, at that point, um, uh, some of the corporates, be it Chinese corporates, as well as international multi international companies to use this opportunity and start issuing dim sum bond. This market peaked in 2015, 2016 at around 17 um, billion US dollars. But as the onshore China bond market gradually open up with more ways to access, we start seeing this market becoming smaller because a lot of the issuers, um, particularly China issuers, have moved back and issue bonds in onshore market in renminbi instead of tapping into this dim sum bond market. Having said that, about 70% of this market is still um, Chinese issuers, um, but you see other 25% um, being some of the multinationals, be it some of the high quality banks from Middle East, uh, UEA, and, and also some large multinational names as well. This uh, market, as mentioned, is rated by international rating agency. Average rating is probably going to be um, A+. You see that the, or, um, the paler um, green color on the bottom right-hand side is about 50% at single A. Um, and so basically, it's very high quality credits. Um, you'll be rated by international rating agencies. Uh, you get currency risk, you get currency exposure, um, it's relatively stable and steady compared to the offshore US dollar bond market in that sense. Finally, going to page 10, coming into some of the projections number that we have for the growth of the onshore market, you see that um, we expect the growth to continue, um, it likely to double itself in 2025, and then afterwards, it will probably be subject to in terms of the growth of the uh, economy um, to lead um, the development of the onshore bond market going forward. Page 11 gives you a breakdown in terms of for the past eight years, in terms of where's the growth coming from. You see that um, there's different colors, meaning different kind of bonds and instruments available. The most commonly, talk, commonly talked about will be the Chinese government bond in the orange color, which is around 20 um, trillion CNY, as well as the uh, paler, uh, pink color, which is the financial and policy bank bonds. Um, these are the ones that got talked about because um, these are part of the index inclusion by some of the global indices. And as a investors looking at aggregated indices, they would need to um, gradually um, allocate to um, the policy bank bonds as well as the Chinese government bonds going forward, given um, a lot of the indices have gradually included this into that index. We expected this will probably bring close to about 300 um, billion US dollar inflow into the market. Um, the other part of the market, you see local government bonds, we call it LGBs. These are bonds issued by the local government for their own fiscal balances and funding. There's also the um, credit market, which is around 20 a trillion CNY and the other onshore instrument. The yellow one is the offshore US dollar bond market that I talk about that's close to 1 trillion US dollars. Moving on quickly, next page. So why do we need to consider China bonds? Um, there could be some interesting um, characteristic. First of all, if you look at this page, you'll see that the natural um, yield itself is actually quite attractive. If you buy a 10 year government Chinese government bond, we call it China CGB onshore, you'll probably get about 3%. This is in local currency basis. And if you compare to the rest of the world, this is still quite attractive, even after hedging. Um, on the right-hand side, you see the sharp ratio that we have demonstrated that for the past five years, by considering either onshore offshore renminbi bonds, or even 
um, some of the offshore US dollar bonds, they do provide relatively attractive sharp ratio compared to the other major asset classes across the world as well. Next page, page 14. Um, this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of index inclusion. This really began back in 2017 um, when there's been already chatters um, coming from Bloomberg markets um, talking about including China as part of the global aggregate index as well as the EM local currency indices. Um, and then this gradually happens throughout for the past three years and different indices have decided different timing in terms of um, index inclusion. The right hand side is the estimated, estimated passive inflows that could um, bring into China given the index inclusion. This is all just passive inflows and we have not um, accounted for any potential active inflows or allocation um, coming from other um, uh, manager um, on an active basis as well. Page 15 gives you uh, another way of considering which are the biggest segment in the Chinese bond market. Um, local government bonds accounted for about 22%. Uh, CGBs and the policy bank bonds accounted around 34%. Interbank notes, we call it um, negotiate um, NCD, negotiate certificates for banks is about 10%. Basically, banks issue that um, to, to provide liquidity for each other. And then the yellow one uh, will be kind of grouped together in terms of the corporate market. And that's probably closer to about 24%. On the right hand side, that gives you a little bit more color in terms of foreign ownership. You see that the Chinese government bond at the moment will have ownership around 50, close to 15%. Historically, this has been much lower, probably around 4% and have been gradually building up. That's probably echoing to some of the index inclusion comments that I've made earlier on is that as a, a global aggregate manager, uh, because of the index inclusion, you kind of need to start deploying into the Chinese government bonds as well as um, looking at the um, attractive risk adjusted return that I've shown earlier on as well. Yet policy banks is still um, about three to four, three to five percent lower compared to the Chinese government bond. Um, one of the reasons behind is that there's uh, potentially a little bit more tax benefit uh, for um, international investors when they consider Chinese government bonds. Local government bonds is still majority owned by um, domestic banks or policy banks. Um, this is below. Um, 2.0.1% for um, international investors. And the onshore corporate bond market is still at an early stage in terms of foreign participation at about 1%. Going forward, we do believe that as international investors gain more experience as well as knowledge about the Chinese bond market via the Chinese government bonds and the policy bank bond, it will be natural that we'll, they will gradually branch into other segments into the market, be it the local government bonds or even the Chinese onshore corporate bonds. There are investors that have already have experience with the uh, government bonds that have uh, contacted us in terms of having um, more willing or, or aiming to have more engagement with asset manager that have exposure or have experience in the onshore corporate bond market. For Fidelity, we have both onshore and offshore presence. So we have an investment team sitting in uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, but we also have a full investment team sitting in Shanghai so that we can pick up um, local nuances, market colors, interpretation on policies, and also um, local news as well. One of the key benefits of, of considering um, Chinese government bond, next page, is the low correlation benefits. Um, if you look at this page, you'll see for the first four, these are renminbi denominated onshore and offshore bonds and its correlation with the international asset classes. What you see is that it's very green. Um, basically, the correlation is very low. Um, and one of the reasons behind is because um, the uh, renminbi itself is still not um, totally free float and there's certain capital control over it and the policy directions uh, between uh, China and the rest of the world is slightly diverge. So um, this correlation benefit is one of the reason, one of the key reasons why a lot of international investors will consider adding onshore bonds, uh, Chinese government bonds or onshore bonds or Chinese bonds into the portfolio to bring in a, a little bit of the diversification benefit, lowering the overall volatility of the portfolio as well. Jumping on, to, um, I'll jump to page 18. Next one. Yeah. So we get asked a lot of time, how is the best way to think about approaching the onshore market? 
Um, these are two examples. Um, the left hand side is an example where you could you'll be adding a certain percentage of CGBs, Chinese government bonds, into your portfolio. What you see is um, the portfolio itself with increased amount of CGB allocation. The volatility, which is on the bottom hand uh, bottom axis, will gradually decrease. There will be a sweet spot in terms of how much um, a portfolio should add in terms of um, CGBs. But what the fact here is, by adding on CGB, it will certainly lower the volatility and at the same time gradually maximize some of the potential target returns as well. On the right hand side, there's an alternative that for some of the investors that may not want to do so much details, they wanted to engage an asset manager, um, they can potentially consider an all China fixed income strategy, uh, which Fidelity do have one. And you see that um, for such strategy, there's potential to um, perform in line with a lot of the different indices. So be it in the yellow color, which is the onshore uh, China broad market indices or the paler um, blue color, the dim sum investment grade or the Jackie investment grade, i.e. the US dollar Asian market. Um, an all China strategy given is flexibility to allocate across the three different ways to access China fixed income market. It does allow it to have um, a consistent performances versus the other indices as well. The other question that we get asked a lot of times is that um, how to access it. If I'm if I'm a foreign investor, I wanted to tap into the onshore bond market. How should I go about thinking about it? Uh, page 19. So um, there has been various options um, throughout the years. Um, the latest will be Bond Connect. Um, it will be it's already um, be uh, operating since 2017. At the moment, it's just northbound. Northbound meaning offshore going to China. And there has been some chatter in the market that South Bank could be possible, i.e. Chinese investor money coming into the offshore US dollar bond market. Um, this um, channel is a lot more simple to set up. You don't have quotas. You don't need to go through a lot of regulatory um, applications. Um, this is more a simplified version and has been introduced back in 2017. Uh, previously, as uh, institutional investors, you need to engage in uh, QFII, Qualified Foreign Institutional Investors. Back in 2011, they will give you a quota. There will be a limited list of asset managers have access. But this has already broadened out um, in 2016, where you can access the um, interbank bond market, uh, which is a lot easier in terms of access. One of the key differences between this three market is that the settlement for um, 2017 is actually um, um, offshore. So your um, settlement can be done offshore, whereas, sorry, not settlement, your custodian, it can be done in offshore, whereas in, in the QV and the CIBM, the custodian need to be done in the onshore market. Um, a few more frequently asked questions. Uh, we get asked a lot about Roman V appreciation and depreciation. Um, I think one of the key views that we have is that coming from the Chinese government point of view, they actually want a long term stability of the currency in order to allow more financial reforms as well as gradually opening up the economy. So if you look at the bottom, um, next page, sorry, and the next one, yeah. If you look at the yellow chart, um, this is uh, what we call CFED basket. Um, this is where the Chinese government would look into managing the currency against um, the a basket of international currency. Most of them are the key trade partners. Um, US dollars used to be on top, I think about 22%. I think this has recently been took over by Euro um, because of the trade war. I think the importance of US in terms of the trade with China has came down, whereas Europe has become more important. So. Um, basically, what it means is that if you look at for the past four years, this have been range bound between 90 to 98. We believe that this is likely to be the case going forward, at least for short to medium term in terms of a uh, renminbi currency relative to the CFAT basket. Um, moving up to the chart on the top, you see DXY and then the currency of CNY itself. A lot of the times, the currency movement on CNY can mostly be explained with the strength and weaknesses of US dollars. So um, CNY doesn't have a singular relationship with US dollars, but if any, CNY have a multiple relationship with the trade partners, which was I, which was what I was referring to earlier on in terms of the CFAT basket. 
So from a European investor point of view, I think um, um, it probably still worth considering B, given the stability that the Chinese government aiming to um, deliver um, for the currency um, within the CFAT basket. Credit rating agencies is one of the questions that we got get asked as well. Um, currently, as I mentioned since the beginning, most of the onshore bond market bonds are rated by domestic rating agency, which is on the left hand side. You see majority of it is going to be in relatively high rating. Um, there's no science um, behind it, but if you kind of map it with the international equivalent on the right hand side, that will be the table. This is all indicative. Um, so there could be some um, outliers as well. What it's really trying to say here is that credit differentiation is still developing, uh, even from the onshore rating uh, or, the, or the domestic uh, credit rating agencies. As you see, a lot of ratings is actually concentrated in some of the higher rated credit category. Um, going forward, we do expect this to gradually change. What we have already um, observed on the market um, is that historically a lot of the credit analysts, albeit investors, will be more focused on the macro front, the policy front, and the, and the um, relationship of the uh, issuer with the government. But um, given a lot of the uh, idiosyncratic event that's been happening, we have noticed a shift in terms of the orange oil investors' focuses that they start looking at the fundamental, the standalone credit, and financials, and business and operation of these issuers as well. Page 23 gives you a snapshot in terms of the international rating agency entering to the onshore market, as well as some of the names of the um, uh, China onshore rating agencies. What interesting is that there's definitely cross broader expansion. You see onshore rating agency having license in Hong Kong. SFC is the regulator in Hong Kong, and they are gradually picking up licenses in Hong Kong, and they are also engaging um, offshore issuers in terms of um, using their rating for offshore US dollar issuances. Most of them are still Chinese corporates or Chinese issuers um, which have tapped the offshore US dollar bond market. On the other hand, you also see uh, the international rating agency using different approach in terms of um, entering into the onshore market. Uh, SNP have obtained uh, Chinese regulator approval, Fitch go via a JV, and also they are going to launch, they, they already launched the China's rating unit, Moody's go via a, an investment into the onshore rating agencies. Um, I will finish off on page 24, which is a summary in terms of our uh, Asian uh, fixed income team in Asia. We have one of the largest Asian fixed income team in Asia, close to about 40 uh, members um, across Asia in India, Sydney, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Shanghai, Tokyo, where we continue to be building our onshore presence. You see that since 2015, we have been building our presence. And at the moment, we have about seven uh, team members, investment team member in China, and we are continuing uh, adding on resources. Because we see that having boots on the ground and um, people on the ground to understand, to interpret and decipher um, the local message is very important, especially um, China is an ever-changing market. Um, what you, we learn about today or tomorrow could potentially be very different in six months down the road, six, six months time down the road. So it's very important to have a local engagement um, coming from our point of view. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll see uh, if there's any questions. Yeah, Vanessa, thank you very much uh, for an interesting presentation. Uh, lots of uh, interesting insights, uh, good good numbers to 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 join the story. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one I would like to ask is, um, do you reckon you showed the sharp ratios who are which are quite high? Uh, do you reckon more than in other countries we have to account for some let's say non financial risk like political risk in the sharp ratio to to make it a better comparison? Okay. Um... I think one of the things, um, well, to begin with, we probably will need to use a consistent approach um, by comparing the same sharp ratio. Um, another way to think about uh, the political risk, if you will, is um, actually China sovereign is rated by international rating agency. Um, it may not cover everything you want in terms of the political risk, but it does use a consistent approach when they come to different sovereign rating and they are rated at um, China is rated by single A. So I think using the same consistent approach is very important. And adding back on is having um, boots on the ground is also important in terms of understanding the political risk. And that dialogue between the onshore 
uh, team as well as the offshore team members is really where we can add vigor and be understanding the political risks as or, or even debating in terms of uh, credit risk exposure as well for our portfolio. Okay, thanks. A question from Mark Geene from PGGM. Um, he is wondering about the bankruptcy regime and uh, let's say, are there any legal particularities uh, that, that foreign investors should be aware of um, uh, regarding the legal position of, of domestic investors? Uh, really because, of course, when investing in fixed income, it's always uh, most important to look at the downside. Uh, so, so that part is, uh, is quite interesting, of course. Okay, um, I think the first um, comment I will make is that um, there will be structural subordination um, between the onshore investors and the offshore investors. Um, that's really the structure of the bonds um, because the bonds, um, well, if, if you're considering um, the offshore uh, bonds issued in the US dollar, um, Asian US dollar market, there will be structural subordination. I think that's the first point. Um, the second point is um, you will follow the same hierarchy. So um, the banks potentially lending to the Chinese corporate will probably be priority compared to the bond holders. Um, as any of the restructuring or any of the um, default situation, um, people with, with experience at be it in offshore and onshore market will know that when it comes to a debt meeting, everyone will be kind of put together in the room. And then um, in a way, the larger amount of um, liabilities you have, or the more leverage you have with the company tends to allow you to have a little bit more leverage um, during negotiation. Um, I think that probably still um, ex uh, is the same case for uh, Chinese uh, corporates. However, I think one of the key differences is um, in a, a DM world, these kinds of restructuring, these kind of um, liquidation meetings, um, this kind of debt holder meetings will probably um, happen in more commercial terms. Whereas in the onshore market, um, this may not necessarily be the case. Um, hear me out. Um, I think for privately owned enterprise, most of them will probably happen in a more commercial terms. However, it gets a little bit in terms of a gray area when it comes to state-owned enterprise, SOE, when it comes to um, local government um, funding vehicles or any sort of um, semi-SOE, semi-local government-owned entity. Because um, at that point, there will be influence or there will be some sort of um, uh, policy potential coming from the be it the local government or central government in terms of how they wanted that negotiation to happen. Um, this will probably be the differences between the kind of DM workout versus a, a China workout. And that's why um, some of the headline news that you've been seeing in the market, um, there has been some sort of a dragging out or uncertainty and, and some sort of lack of transparency and information. That's really because it takes a while for the um, local government for the banks, as well as the local bondholder to work out in terms of what um, the, the best uh, restructuring could be for uh, for corporate or any uh, potential situation. Thanks, Vanessa. Interesting insights. Um, <clears throat> maybe a, a final question, if I don't get any other, other questions on the chat. Um, you spoke about this, that also uh, explains APG's perspective, uh, joining a local partner, having boots on the ground, uh, really focusing on, on getting to know the insights into the China bond market. Um, so uh, let's say the question, do you need boots on the ground? Uh, that's that's uh, a no question because th that's a definite yes from, from both the Thais and your perspective. Um, given the fact that China bonds are, are are being incorporated into benchmarks more uh, and more often. Uh, is a passive approach here uh, something uh, that's that's a possibility? Well, it is. It will be a possibility. But do you would you recommend that, or would you say no? Always go active here. And that's also a question to Thais. So uh, if Thais is still here, I also want to get Thais's answer. But Vanessa first. Okay. Thank you. Um... Interesting that you raised this question. Um, in fact, we are in the process of um, formulating a, um, a 
we, we don't call it passive, but we call it a systematic a strategy when it comes to Chinese government bonds and policy bank bonds. That's more related to the part that is related to index inclusion. So i.e. a aggregated manager, they wanted to allocate a certain percentage of the portfolio, then they can potentially think about um, the systematic approach that I was talking about earlier on. One of the reasons behind is that, um, let's face it, I mean, you're talking about 3% in terms of unhatched yield coming from the Chinese government bonds. If you kind of wanted to hedge it, that probably cuts off another 1.5 to 2%, you're left with a percent. Um, so in order to make it reasonable for investors, um, a passive approach or a sci-fi approach probably is more economical. I think that's one. I think the second part of it is, um, if any, the Chinese government bond and the policy bank bonds are actually the most liquid part within the uh, onshore, uh, onshore market, which means that it allows a passive a passive strategy or a sci-fi strategy to deliver what it's supposed to because of the liquidity that's available. Um, however, if you are thinking of going into the credit market, which was something that I was talking about earlier on, that we do believe that the international investors were gradually starting to look at that particular segment, then we think that um, it's essential um, to have a onshore partner or have an asset manager who have boots, the, boots on the ground. Reason being, um, the onshore offshore credit rating agency differences that I was talking about, um, the liquidity for some of the, these onshore bonds uh, particularly on the credit side, is still relatively weak, which means that you need to have traders, to have understanding of the market, to have a conversation with counterparties, um, to have access or to have a gauge in terms of the liquidity. And that's why uh, it makes boots on the ground important. It makes having an active manager important. It also makes having a someone who have already have existing resources in the market important. And that's where Fidelity fits in because we have had access in the onshore market since 2015. We have one of the largest team in Asia. We have a full-fledged investment team, two portfolio managers, traders, and credit research team in Shanghai, uh, which allow us to have the access uh, and interpretation of the onshore market, particularly on the credit front. Thanks, uh, Vanessa. Thais? Yes. Uh, that's already an excellent answer. I talked to one of our bond uh, uh, experts on uh, his feelings on the Chinese credit market and, and indeed whether you how, how you should approach it. And, uh, and so I, I'll make a small uh, exception. He, he told me that uh, if you wanted to trade a CGB, so government bonds or policy banks, maybe because the, you know the, 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 this is a quite low risk uh, in terms of defaults uh, option, you could do it from you know, afar, uh, and you don't need that local knowledge so much. All the rest, I, I like this uh, characterization. He says that the Chinese bond market reminds me of the, the European credit market uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so with APG, we, we also, we didn't start there. We started investing in credits in the US because it was a much more developed market than Europe came online. And in the beginning, it was just, um, yeah, you really needed your credit analysis to be good because there was so much going on. It was very, uh, uh, very hard to get the right information. I think China's in the same place. Um, it's also very hard, I hear, to find good Chinese credit analysts because it's a trade and there's just, you know, they're building this right now. And it, it just takes a few years. Well, I guess more than a few years to become good at it. So uh, it's, it's one thing to say we need to have boots on the ground. It's another thing to find these people to fill the boots, right? It's uh, so so I would characterize it as a if you're if you're away from policy banks and, and the government as a market that has a lot of opportunities. But it's also, uh, yeah, you need somebody who, who holds your hand and uh, and these people can be quite hard to find. So uh, for us, that's been, it's been a hard part of getting a presence in China. And that's why we rely so much on those local partners because they've been in this game for much longer than that. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Thais. Also, thanks, uh, Vanessa. Uh, very interesting presentations. I think uh, what, what a from my introduction where I said it was an irresistible combination of, of growth, size, yield and diversification. Uh, also from, from the case that Vanessa made, uh, that's still very much the case.
uh, an interesting market. Uh, of course, you have to pay attention uh, when investing in, 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 in the China bond market, but as it's opening up, it's a very interesting opportunity. So uh, also the outlook for growth is, uh, is, is, is something that, um, yeah, how will I know by Whitney Houston? Uh, but it, 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 there's, there's enough room, let's say, to, to, for, for interesting growth there. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Thijs and Vanessa, and also thanks a lot to our sponsor, Fidelity, for, for making this webinar possible. Uh, it was very uh, interesting to 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 do the session. Um, hopefully, this uh, it, it will will we'll go back to uh, live sessions uh, in person uh, quickly. But uh, it's always interesting to to have people from uh, abroad dialing in to, to our webinars, like uh, Vanessa. Uh, I know Thais is uh, slightly more closer to to, to my home office, uh, but uh, looking forward to to meeting everybody again uh, in person, uh, probably uh, in in the fall. Uh, and for now, thank you very much, and uh, have. Have a nice day. Right, thanks, guys.